I'm going to say welcome, Michael. Thank you, dear heart, and welcome, everybody. We've got another beautiful sunny day here in Branson, although it uh, sounds like the rains are coming with the storms holding a space for uh, for people in Florida. It looks like uh, some of the uh, water surge is going to be as much as 20 feet. So it's going to be pretty intense down there, so extending support and love and safety and intuition that anyone who's in a a zone where harm could come to them and, and, and you know I've known many people over the years who said oh I'm not leaving I'm I'm always safe and so if uh if you're in that posture I hold the space that it you you're really able to tap into your intuition and and know if you're in a danger zone that you can get out safely and and of course holding the space for your property as well and beyond that all things rock and roll, Miss Jeannie. Do we have anybody in the phone queue with a hand up or anything happening in the chat room? There are no hands up. And let's see, I just got a text from someone. Let me just make sure. Nope, it doesn't have to do with this. So, no, nope, it's all quiet on this end. Okay. Well, then, let's go to the Book of Thomas that we've been covering. And we had just finished saying 26 from the Book of Thomas. And if you don't happen to have a copy, you can uh, – actually, Jeannie, I'll send you a link. I'll, I'll send you a copy of the one that I've got. Maybe we can just put it on the website or a link to it so that uh, okay. people can follow along if they choose. So yesterday's uh, final thought was – the moat which is in your brother's eye you see, but the beam in your own eye you don't see. If you cast out, or when you finally cast out the beam from your own eye, then you'll see to cast the moat. In other words, you'll be able to be of support to others when you give up your own blockage of truth. You know, we've, uh, we've got this Harvard research that really gives us a big edge on looking at how the mind works this is research that goes back in the 50s. It's the most quoted psychological research in history. Nobody's refuted it. But what they, they were telling, what they're telling us is that in a time frame where they could have somebody hooked up to electrodes and they'd measure 10,000 brain cells firing, the max amount of data that would go into conscious awareness would be nine bits. And if you fill your nine-bit mind with a lie, like, and the whole culture is, you know, the primary motive force of the culture is the lie. I mean, find me somebody who hasn't said over and over and over again, you made me mad, you made me sad, you made me afraid. You know, if you've been through mad, sad, or afraid, you've been through it 87 different times with 42 different people, and you'll notice that you're the only one that was there every time. To say that somebody else is the cause of what's moving inside of you is not only denial and causes you to dissociate from the content of your mind, but when you call your mind's lie, that nine-bit space, when you fill it with a lie and you call that truth, now you're in blockage of truth. You're not fit to serve or help anybody while you're in blockage of truth. And so this one is speaking about, you know, do your own work first. So when you cast out the beam from your own eye, when you get out of your own block to truth and you choose to honor truth sufficiently, then you're going to be fit to serve others. Saying 27, if you fast not from the world, you will not find the kingdom. Now, the world here we're talking about is not the external, you know, what's out there. The world we're talking about here is the world of perception. Remember, there's a great focus in the whole teaching of Yeshua on what was called the mind of man. Remember, he called Peter Satan, when he, and he informed him what he meant by Satan. He said, for Peter, you're thinking in the mind of man rather than the plan of God. You're stuck in carbon-based memory. And so if we're stuck in carbon-based memory then we're stuck in that whole false world. And there's no room for actuality, time frame, that they spoke of 
10,000 brain cells firing a maximum of nine bits of data going into conscious awareness, it's been estimated that perhaps there's as much as 20 trillion bits of data potentially available in the actuality. You're not going to find that if you're stuck in your nine-bit mind. That's why forgiveness is so important in the whole process. And not thinking of forgiveness as letting other people off the hook because there's something painful moving inside of you, because your nine-bit mind is showing you something painful, but rather taking the beam out of your own eye and recognizing if you're experiencing some sort of pain, it's because there's an energy in you that you need to deal with. If you're talking about somebody else being the cause of that, then you're living the lie, blockage of truth. It's time to step up to the plate and honor truth. So he's saying you're going to have to take time out from functioning out of perception. Now, it's a powerful film we've talked about before. If you haven't seen it, I suggest you go watch it. It's called Saved by the Light, story of a man named Daniel Brinkley who died. Now, that's about as deep a fast from the world as you can get. He experienced clinical death. They were sending him up to the morgue. When clinical death occurs, carbon-based memory shuts up. Now, it's not a near-death experience. It's called, the truth of it is it's a near-life experience because most people are so stuck in the world between their ears, the world of perception, the world of the lie, that they never escape from it. So Daniel Brinkley escaped from it. He was struck by lightning, dead as a a proverbial doornail. And they resuscitated him. And when they resuscitated him, everything changed. I mean, a guy who was nasty, who was literally a killer, a guy who beat people up just for the fun of it, a guy who was just... um, one of the things I acknowledge Daniel for is, you know, he was in, involved in creating the film and that he allowed himself to be shown for the SOB that he was, I thought was pretty amazing and pretty honest of him. And then it's interesting in that particular case because A short time after he has this near-life experience where he experiences clinical death, is resuscitated, and everything that had meaning to him prior to that, everything that his life was based on, he let go of it, like I'm finished with that. He had the insight. He knew who he was. And then carbon-based memory came back online, and he shifted back into that hostile, attacking, vicious persona, carbon-based self, that he considered to be who he was prior to that near-life experience. Then you see the conflict between the being and the non-being self very clearly. And so what I hear Yeshua saying here in saying 27 out of the book of Thomas is, you've got to give up perception and give yourself some space to experience being, living in a state of being, rather than living out of images in the mind that are nothing but replicating images from carbon-based memory, generational patterns. So going out and creating clinical death to have this experience is, is kind of risky. I don't suggest it. But there is a reliable, consistent, persistent way to have that experience. And that is called forgiveness. Allah, first century Aramaic Yeshua, not the Greek idea of I'm going to let you off the hook because my carbon-based memory is showing me this, but rather the form of forgiveness that Yeshua taught 2,000 years ago was how to collapse or fast from the world. Now, when you utilize that particular technology, the fast might only be a fraction of a second at first. But if you consistently, persistently use that forgiveness tool, collapsing perception, collapsing perception, collapsing perception, collapsing perception, there'll come a point where your space in that condition will get 
will expand. And then, rather than having to go out and race and, and gather all the things of the world and get things done, the second part of this statement starts to make sense. So, if you fast not from the world, you will not find the kingdom. You will not experience yourself as a human being. You will not experience what is within you as potential. And then he says, if you keep not the Sabbath as Sabbath, you will not see the Father. Now, remember, the Father is defined as love. What's he saying, the Sabbath? Remember, the scriptures talk about the Sabbath wasn't made for the Creator. The Sabbath was made for man that you take time. The world is going to knock on your door and want to keep you running 24-7, 365, so that you never look within, and you always think something's chasing you, so you're always on go, always performing, and not giving yourself time to just fast from the world. Forgiveness empowers that fasting process. And you will become more and more deeply acquainted with the active presence of love in you as you allow yourself that fast. Saying 28, I stood in the middle of the world, he says, and I appeared to them in flesh. I found them all drunk. Now you look at the atrocities committed in our world under the influence of alcohol, and I don't think he's necessarily talking here about alcohol. We can be drunk on possessions. We can be drunk on sex. We can be drunk on all sorts of things. So I found none among them thirsting. It's like people were so shut down by the use of drugs. Now, of course, they didn't have the fancy, you know, drugstore-type drugs we have today. But they had plenty of drugs, hostility, fear, rage, guilt, possessions. So he's saying everybody, their senses were dulled, their senses were shut down, and, and nobody even knew they were thirsty for this. Nobody gave a damn because they were so stuck in satiation. It's interesting, over the years, working with people in still point breathing, and there are ways to use the breath that create a lot of sensations in the body. I remember one medical doctor in particular that came to Heartland, and somebody had done some breath work with him, and it was this really hard pushing, you know, <laughs> kind of breath, which creates all kinds of sensations that make you lightheaded, you know, tingling, all sorts of things, and he just loved that. It's like, no, no, that's not what we're here to do. We're here to give you a moment of respite, not build sensation. We want transformation, not sensation. If you want to, you know, you can just hype your breath up and you can have all kinds of sensations, but it won't lead to healing. The idea of the still point breath is that you are opening the veil of the temple. You know, the holding of the breath, when they said the veil of the temple must be rent in twain, they were not talking about a purple curtain in a church. The temple was this body-mind unit, and the veil was the barrier between the subconscious and the unconscious mind. So when you utilize the breath properly, as in still point, what happens? You experience that same thing of perception collapses. You go into a still point, and everything gets quiet there. If you can get everything to get quiet, and at the same time be out of your mind, that's quantum still point. Still point alone gets the mind to be quiet. But a quiet mind doesn't mean you're out of your mind. The whole idea of the quantum still point is that not only is the mind quiet, you're not engaged in your mind. You're freed of it. And so he's talking about how people are stuck in sensation. Nobody, was there. Nobody even knew they were missing the active presence of love because they were so stuck in their 
satiation. And he says, my soul was afflicted for the sons of men, for they are blind in their heart and they do not see. In other words, he's looking at them going, you don't, you don't even know you're missing it. You, you don't know that you could be totally, completely filled with this all-powerful presence right down to and including in your cellular structure, in your perceptions even, in your mind, in your relationships with this active presence of love. He then makes reference to the generational, the way this is generationally patterned into people. So again, he says, I was feeling, you know, this brought some disturbance for me, probably a piece of work for him. For they were blind in their heart and they did not see. For empty they came into the world, seeking also to depart empty from the world. In other words, when the generational patterns instilled no awareness of being, you know, when the the bloodline was about either religiosity to the extreme, which is just the same as the family of drug addicts, They were empty. There was no clue. There was no modeling of presence of being as a human. And so what what happened to people who didn't have that experience? They got into their stuff, and you think about it. You know, one of, I, I, I thank the creator for the guidance on this one with Arya Rain, our granddaughter, and, of course, all of our grandchildren from here on out because what I did with my children and I didn't know any better is I taught them about the world. You know, you hold a trinket up, you say, oh, look at this. Look at this. Oh, look, you can read. Oh, look, pictures. Oh, colors. Oh, look, 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 everything out there. And so a life becomes outer directed. I didn't know enough to assist my children to have an inner directed life. But Arya Rain, she's now six. From the time she was four, if we said it was time for meditation, she'd sit us down, she'd put us in posture, she'd tell us how to breathe, and she'd guide the meditation. She'd go inside. And what Yeshua was saying is, you know, this, this people doesn't even have a guide that tells them there is an inside to be looked into, that there is an interior life that is far more important far more rewarding than the external life and that it is only when you fully experience the internal life that you can even begin to totally experience the external. So he says, for empty they came into the world, no modeling for something else, seeking also to depart from the world empty. But now they're drunk. When they've thrown off their wine, then perhaps they'll repent. In other words, and the word repent doesn't mean you're a sinner, go, you know, show yourself to the priest because you're a horrible sinner. The word repent comes the Italian, repense, which means to think again, to turn the mind in another direction. You know, on the level where we're creators, we have 360 degree vision. When we're always looking at what's going on in perception, And some people will try to turn away from what's going on in perception. But because you've got 360-degree vision, you can't turn away. This idea of repent from the Aramaic is to turn toward another source, to let go of this as your source and realize that all of this is just effect. And to turn and embrace the input that's waiting to come in through you into the world that will tap you into your true purpose. And so he's saying, if you can get this mind to be freed of its drugs, whatever they are, he uses the idea of alcohol here, but if you can get the mind to be free of its drugs, then you'll become aware that, oh, I could be turning... 180 degrees here and embracing the possible, embracing relationship with the active presence of love from which I came. 
and then saying 29. If the flesh has come into being because of the spirit, it is a marvel. But if the spirit has come into being because of the body, it is a marvel of marvels. And and so what he's saying is, isn't it just amazing that there is this inner life, there is this spiritual life, and it comes to in, in, express itself, to incarnate into the world, into physiology. And then he says, but as for me, I marvel at this, how this great wealth, that is this state of being, has settled into this poverty. You know, there's another line in the scriptures where he talks about, he laments, you know, how could such a magnificent creature as a human get lost in this state? How, how does this happen? And what he's saying here is there is nothing in the world that you want. And most people are, yeah, I want money, I want things, I want power, I want this, I want that, I want that. It's like, no, you don't want that. You want what that will bring you. And you think what it will bring you is back to satisfaction. Remember that kid's song a few years ago? <laughs> I can't get no satisfaction. You will never get satisfaction from the world. Lots of satiation. But the sad thing about satiation is there always has to be more and more and more. You know, uh, a million is enough. There's got to be 10. 10 million enough. There's got to be 100. 100 isn't enough. There's got to be a billion. There's got to be 2 billion. There's got to be 5 billion. It's, there's just never enough. Satiation never brings satisfaction. So, in essence, what he's saying is what we call the physical world and what we look out to with our eyes or seem to look out to with our eyes is nothing but absolute poverty. The only thing it has is what you bring to it. And if you bring nothing to it, then it will seem that life is stingy and life withholds and life is, is a challenge and a problem. But in essence, what he's saying is, in your being, in your created essence, there is this monumental wealth. And most people have forgotten the wealth and settled into poverty. He's like marveling at that. And then he says, why? He says, because you're drugging yourself. What kind of drugs are popular in our culture? Sex, food, alcohol, drugs of a thousand kinds, legal and illegal, hostility, busyness. You know, if I ask somebody over the years, you know, when I do a Why Is This Happening to Me Again workshop, I always put out an invitation. You know, do five worksheets a day for the next 40 days and, when people first hear that workshop and they're rah rah, yeah, Michael, this is awesome. I, I love this. And that might be on a Sunday afternoon. And then we're we're doing a week of workshops. So by Thursday night, I ask people, you know, I'll ask, you know, if there are a hundred people in the audience, I'll ask how how many have done your five worksheets today? If there were a hundred on Sunday and usually by Thursday there'll maybe be hundred and twenty five, hundred and thirty. I'll be really happy if three people put their hand up. I'll feel like the Sunday was a real success if three people have done five worksheets a day. And most of the people in the workshop on Sunday were ready and rocking and committed. You know, the brain cells were firing. They got it, and it's like, yes, I want it. And when I say ask the question, well, why didn't you Get those worksheets done that you were so committed to. 99.9999% of the time, it's I was too busy. What does busy mean? I'm being drugged by the things of the world. And so giving up that drug state and returning to the truth of being. And we did a a workshop several years ago up in Ionia, Michigan at a maximum security prison, an old Civil War fort that they converted to a prison. And these prisoners are in there for 25 years to life. Did a workshop series. Some very excited people. 
wonderful receptivity from the warden of the prison, the best support of all the jails and all the prisons I've been in over the decades, the best, like, just amazing support for the prisoners. And there was a teacher who lived nearby, and when we finished a couple of weeks, he went in to do a support group and then was going to teach laws of living. And laws of living always has attached to it that somebody has to invest in it in order to participate in it. What they found in the early days in the prisons, that if the prisoner didn't pay for the class, then they didn't benefit from it. They didn't make progress. So these guys are in there 25 years to life. They might get, you know, 25 cents an hour for a couple hours a day in the in the commissary or in the laundry or what have you, but they have the money. And so we set it up that the cost the cost of the class would be five worksheets a day for the time period leading up to the intensive. When the day of the workshop came and everybody was so excited about it, they asked for the five worksheets a day. Every person had the same excuse. Now, this is a group of people who are locked in their cells, at least unless they've got a job in the commissary, as I say, for an hour or two or three. But otherwise, they're locked in their cells 23 out of 24 hours. They get one hour of exercise outside. Otherwise, they're locked in their cells for 23 hours. And they were too busy to do those worksheets. It is the world's number one drug. The second drug to busyness is hostility. That's an internally produced drug. It is not an emotion. It's an internally produced anesthetic that anesthetizes people against their pain. And there's the starting point for the drugging of the world that he's talking about. So what most people call the world, whether the thing of perception or what's going on out there, is nothing but poverty. The riches, the wealth is within. And when you acquire that, when you tap into that, and you bring that to the world, then you get to fulfill your purpose, and the world benefits from who you are and what you bring to the world, which is how the game is designed to be played. And saying 30... And where there are three gods, they are gods. And where there are two or one, I'm with him. You know, what the heck does that mean? Well, you remember that the society Yeshua was born and raised in was relatively primitive. And there were still, you know, every community had its gods. You know, the, the communities that farmed, they had their food gods. And, and so... In essence, what he's saying is, I'm not going to discriminate against you because you happen to be of the ABC religion or the XYZ religion. I don't care. I'm here to bring you the universal experience of the presence of love, of who you are. It's not my game to discriminate against someone else. There were people who complained to him about, oh, this is only supposed to be for us Jews. No, no. So here he's informing people that whatever your belief is, I'm here to connect you with the power inside of you that will give you a direct experience of the creator. And I'm here to offer that to anybody and everybody. And then saying 31, no profitable is acceptable in his village. A physician does does not heal those who know him. You know, if you look, there's only one place that Yeshua never performed any of what people call miracles. Why? In his hometown. Oh, that's that snotty kid and those kid Jesus. And basically, you know, if if you are fit in people's minds in a certain way, then the tendency is those people can only hear a certain limited expression. Remember that in the same way that when when we say I see something in the world, the fact is the eye is a one-way valve. Information comes in. Nothing, 
Nothing is seen out of the eyes. That's a fallacy. The images that we think we see out there through our eyes are actually images generated by the brain. So our seeing is of carbon-based memory, or it is of the mind that was called the mind of Christ, the mind of love. If love was active, then the seeing would be different. Well, so it is with the listening. It's the same thing. All of our hearing is a result of what's firing in brain cells. It's not a result of what somebody says to us. That's why Yeshua puts an emphasis on you've got to have the eyes to see and the ears to hear. If you don't have the brain cells, if you don't have the eyes to see and the ears to hear from what he's telling you, then you, he's telling you nothing. And everybody had the eyes to see and the ears to hear who he was as Jesus, and it would be difficult for them to hear anything new or different because their listening had already been established through their long-term relationship with him. And saying 32. Well, we're at the halfway point, Miss Jeannie. Let me just check in with you and see if there's anybody in the phone queue with a hand up or anybody in the chat room with a thought for us. It is all quiet. Okay, well, our call-in number, if you're on one of those stations where we can't see you, if you do want to interact with us and have a question, our call-in number is 563-999-3581. If you call that number, you're listening directly to the show. And then if you push one, that'll raise a hand in the control panel. Gene will know you want to talk to us, and we'll have a conversation, see if we can support you. So saying 32, a city that is built on a high mountain and fortified cannot fall, nor can it remain hidden. In other words, you know, and he said it differently in another part of the scriptures. He talks about, you know, don't hide your light under a bushel basket. Or one of the sayings he had is there's a light in a man. There's a light in a woman that is designed to shine out from them. The bushel basket are the hostilities and fears that are unforgiven, that are unresolved from the generations. So he's saying, put it out there. Build your spiritual body, your spiritual awareness, and then make it accessible. Saying 33, what thou shalt hear in thine ear, proclaim to the other ear on your rooftops. For no man lights a lamp and sets it under a bushel nor does he put it in a hidden place. So when you develop the brain cells to hear the truth of the the state of being that humans are designed to live in, you know, he says, proclaim it to the other ear. What other ear? Well, you've got to give it to your brain. The brain resists, the brain is the resistor, one who misleads that carbon-based memory system. And so he's saying, speak it out, and as you speak it, as you hear it and you speak it, it will become enlarged in you, strengthened in you, become available to you. So he's saying, if you really, if you're hearing this, if it's, if it's building some new brain cells and it's coming to a new place, you can't just go hide it away and pretend you never heard it or keep it to yourself in secret because it is the reinforcement of it, the conversation with it, being engaged in community with it that builds the brain cells and strengthens them so that they are fully available. So you don't open the light of awareness of who you are as a human being, and then go hide it under a bushel basket. You take that light and you put it up on the light stand so that all who come and go can see its light. So it's in the reinforcement of extending it to others and sharing it that it's strengthened energetically, that it's strengthened in you yourself. 
And saying 34, if a blind man lead a blind man, both will fall into the pit. If somebody in hostility or fear is leading another in hostility or fear, they're both going to destroy themselves. Find counsel where there is the active presence of love that resonates with your true being and supports you in stepping into that state of active present love, into that state of being. By sharing it with others, you strengthen it. You know, we've talked before about regulatory speech from our Laws of Living course. And regulatory speech is the speech that controls physiology, that controls chemistry in the body, that controls emotions, that controls perception, that controls our whole creative process. That's regulatory speech. And regulatory speech starts from the outside. This is basically the principle that he's speaking of here. It starts from the outside. And then one speaks it. Once one speaks it, then one begins to speak it, contemplate it silently in his own mind or her own mind. Once that is done and it's experienced to alleviate stress, then that speech becomes regulatory speech. And once you've got that, once you've solidified that, it's yours for eternity. And that ties in with the next saying, saying 35. He says, it is not possible for anyone to go into the strong man's house and take it from him by force. Unless he bind his hands, then he will be able to plunder his house. So once you begin to correct your mind and make sure that your source is connected to love, that would be... My, what I hear him saying there is that would be the strong man or the strong woman. And nobody can take that. But if you can get someone to, to buy into, and, and you know, here he says, unless he bind his hands, unless you get this person to bring some sort of expression into the world that is based in the lie, if you can get someone to do that, then you can take over someone's life and destroy them. You get them believing that, you know, fight for peace. We're going to fight for a better world. Excuse me, if you fight for a better world, the tools you use to produce a result always produce a result exactly like the tools, and you're going to have a world of fighting if you fight for a better world. Love for a better world? Yeah. Function from love. And so here he's saying is once you're connected to that, you're that person who's in strength. Make sure that you don't get tricked into buying into or working from thought disorders. That would be the binding of his hands, getting his hands to work in that arena, or your whole life will be overtaken. You know, if you can get somebody off purpose, and you know, most of the world doesn't even know they have a purpose. There's a whole workshop we do called Purpose, Personal Power, and Commitment. And I've seen so many people's lives turn around on that simple concept. You have a purpose. Now, the world has brainwashed you with this purpose. The world wants you to be a good commercial servant. That's all. And if you buy into that, then your true being, your true purpose will be hidden from you. There's a worksheet on our website called the Purpose Worksheet pretty simple, straightforward. You don't really need the workshop to fill that out. And or if you fill it out and you want to jump on the show and ask questions about it, you're certainly welcome to. But once you discover what your purpose is, you realize that it's not to get stuff. People who have railed on me over the years, Michael, you used to be in the business world. You had three businesses and 60 employees. I heard you used to have a Mark III in your driveway on one side and an Eldorado on the other side. It's like, yeah, that's true. I used to think that, you know, that it was about money. I used that's what I used to think. And now, for the last forty years, you've gone around. You've traveled anywhere in the world that people invite you to travel. You paid your own expenses and you did your workshops free. Are you nuts, man? No, I don't think so. No. The purpose of life is not to gather stuff. 
Find your unique and individual purpose. That's what that worksheet is about. And then the way that power, you know, the second part of that workshop, power flows through an energy system when the energy system is aligned. It doesn't flow through the energy system when the energy system efforts. Oh, I'm going to do work really hard to make this happen. doesn't mean you don't work hard, but it doesn't come from effort. It comes from alignment. You know, if the TV antenna uh, uh, on your roof is out of alignment and somebody goes up and tweaks it, all of a sudden your sound and your picture get better. There's an increase in the flow of energy. Determine what your purpose is. Recognize the things that get in the way, the things that you've had your hands bound to, and take back your house. Otherwise, the world will be continuously trying to take you off purpose. Saying 36. You have a hand up. Oh, great. Let's say hello to our hand. Bob in Australia. Welcome to the show, Bob. Hey. Good morning. Hey there, good sir. Welcome. How do you be? (laughs) A very good question. (laughs) Yeah, just um, my natural remedies for my um, uh, very severe prostate cancer and also fluoride poisoning. Um, yeah, my natural remedies are really going well and I'm learning a lot on the journey. And I just really um, like what you were saying about finding one's purpose. For me, um, it was like two stages. Um, coming out of depression, the only way I could really do that was to find my own truth. And so um, this is around about 2005 when I became the ship's captain. And I decided to set, what is, you know, I asked myself this question, what is my life purpose? And so at that time, being master and commander, I set my life purpose to be, to simply find my own truth. And that led me on a voyage of, um, yeah, realizing that everything I held as true was absolutely you know, 180 degrees away from the truth. So I embarked on a journey of, you know, establishing my personal truth by questioning everything. And how do I know what is my truth? Whatever resonates with my heart. But what drives me today is my mission. And that's my mission is to eradicate suicide. And um, from my life's journey, I, I believe it's doable. And so it's my mission that's, that uh, gives me the zest for life. Um, yeah, and um, you know, people say, oh, Bob, you got cancer and blah, 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 blah. And, you know, I'm, I'm, my doctor's amazed that I'm not in, you know, excruciating pain. And I said to him, well, you know, the, the answer's obvious. What I'm doing is right. You know, my doctor is measuring my condition by, you know, technical tests and things. But my yard stick for my, my recovery, if you like, is what's my quality of life like now. And compared to what it was three, four, five months ago, this is blissful. So, <laughs> so no. life's good, even though even though I can't get to sleep tonight. But I'm not meant to sleep. You know, my body will put me to sleep when it needs to. <laughs> it's so great having you guys to talk to. You know, it's um, it's a a wonderful resource and another oasis of sanity in a crazy world. So thank yeah, you. the world's pretty bizarre, isn't it? Yeah, understandably so. You know, it's like every empire has its day. And for me, uh, the beast dying, and what happens when beasts die? They get more frantic and desperate in their final throes. So I see all this um, craziness as a good, good sign. You know, it's the uh, end of the empire of power and the the dawning of the age of integrity. So it's uh, a beautiful time to be alive. And I'll certainly join you in that one. Strengthening that and bring it, yeah. bring it full, full field into the world. 
and bringing it in so powerfully that all the world gets it. And, you know, my take is when that happens, that's when human life really takes off. That's when we really start to collectively experience what it's all about. Yeah, well, what I reckon, uh, what I've uh, noticed is there was this big panic in 2012 um, when everybody said, oh, the mind said the world's going to end, you know, and, but they, they were saying that there's, um, there was an age that was coming to an end, and it was the age of power. And so since, what, the 21st of December 2012, slowly we have the age of integrity is coming in and over, eclipsing the age of power. And wherever I look around the world, I see that to be true because more and more people are just standing up and saying no you know um, I'm not going to follow orders anymore I'm going to follow my my you know my moral compass my heart so and that's that's you know it's the evolution of this of consciousness is exponential and we've just turned the corner and for me our ascension is assured it's a done deal it's you know <laughs> there's no stopping us now <laughs> Oh. Agreed. Hmm. Michael, if you're talking, we can Definitely hear you. it's an idea whose time has come. I had accidentally pushed my mute button, so I repeat myself. It is an idea whose time has come, and I'm with you 100% on that, Bob. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Yeah, and those that... I don't know, you know, like, will everybody wake up? I don't know, you know. Um, it's down to a personal choice, and I suppose our soul contract, you know, what did you come here to learn? And, um, yeah, que sera, sera, but I think uh, the biggest thing that keeps me sort of buzzing is just my sense of humor and my mission and... And meeting lovely people like you, you know, you're part of my family. Um, yeah, it's very comforting. And even if I call in and I'm really, really down, you know, um, always at the end I feel lifted a bit. And I've got a, a fairly big basket of friends that I can do that with, you know. We'll, we'll catch up and have a conversation. At the end of them, we're both lifted. So we must be doing something right, ain't it? Yeah. Well, joining heart to heart with you, my friend. Joining heart to yeah, heart. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's time. I'm glad you're here for me. Cool. Well, and I think it's pretty cool that, you know, all the way from, well, right now we're in Branson, Missouri, all the way from Branson, Missouri to Australia, there is an energy link, literally, that touches yeah. everything and everyone in between. So. Keep yeah. it moving. Yeah, and that's why I... You know, when, when the physicists... I'm, I'm li oh, go ahead. Yeah, that's why I reckon... Excuse me, go ahead. I reckon I live the life... Yeah. Um, that's why I reckon... This is why I live here, because it's an area of outstanding natural beauty, but also it's an area... There's The concentration of wounded souls here is just... Um, amazing i've never been in a place and so you know i that's i just see myself that's why i'm here you know to to shine my light and really what they say the the brightest lights are found on the darkest shores so <laughs> yeah that 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 suits me for now anyway yeah. i didn't that realize there was that kind of weightiness there in australia i i wasn't i wasn't aware of that yeah, well, you know, um, I keep saying to people over here, Australia's no longer a penal colony. Why are you still touching your forelock to people that are supposed to be working for you? You know, and okay. yeah, it's, um, it's a crazy mood in the country, but it is changing. Yeah, I guess yeah. if you think in terms of it started out as a penal colony, there's a lot of heavy-duty energy in the genes of, uh, even though it's been decades since that was eradicated, or at least tamed, it uh, certainly is an energy that carries on. So holding a space for that yeah. healing. 
yeah, yeah. Um, I believe too that the surrender is, of victimhood. You know, it, it's, yeah, I believe it's part of the Australian psyche, you know, which is um, why I was immune to it because you know I didn't get tainted by that. I didn't get here till eighty nine. Uh, 1989, not 1889. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's all good. It's all good. This um, a couple of weeks ago, I went through um, a week of like it was an emotional maelstrom, a tornado. I really felt helpless, hopeless, lost, unworthy. It was absolutely horrific, but like in the middle of all this, this little phrase popped into my my awareness, and it said, "This too shall pass," and it did, yes. not quickly enough. Yeah, and so I really, really that's what healing that looks like. Yeah, yeah, that's what yeah. healing. I mean, it but has really, to come up. It has to be processed. Yeah, 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 and I truly believe that everything is unfolding perfectly, you know? Yep. Well, joining you in that understanding. (laughs) Well, thank you so much. All right, sir. Well, any other thoughts um, for you today? uh, uh, Hug the next person you see. Okay, I'll do it. I'll do it. I've got <laughs> and tell everybody to do that. <laughs> three of them on the other side of the door here. When I finish this show, I'm going to hug. I'll go hug all three of them. You do the same. Good on you, mate. All right. Blessings. Take care. Good to hear from you. Bye-bye. Bye. All right. Well, Miss Jeannie, we've got about five minutes left. Do we have anybody else in the phone queue with a hand up or anything else happening in the chat room? No, it's all quiet. Well, then let's see if we can get another uh, of the uh, sayings in from Thomas. And and this is I, I, that's interesting. This one ties right in with our conversation just now. And uh, number thirty six is be not anxious from morning to evening, and from evening to morning about what you shall put on. And, uh, you know, I think that was just the conversation that Bob and I were just having, is that anxiety is of the mind. It has to be processed out. It has to be dealt with. And so he's saying, you know, you have to be finished with it. Uh, You have to be finished with fear. The the forgiveness of the fear and the hostility-based mind just has to go. The anxiety uh, that many people suffer from is is just an, uh, an effect or an expression of the thought disorders based in fear. And it's interesting that, you know, we have a a world that, uh, if you look at this set of books called the scriptures, over 300 times, as Yeshua is saying here, do not be anxious, do not be fearful. Over 300 times that book says, fear not, fear not, fear not, fear not, fear not, fear not, fear not. I could say it 300 times, and you still wouldn't have heard how many times that book says, fear not. And yet, there are people whose whole foundation, supposed preachers, whose whole foundation about that book comes in a phrase that fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And I say to that person, have you read this book that you are supposedly preaching from? Because you are so far out in left, left, left field. You're so far off the mark. Creator is the beginning of wisdom. Yeshua said it 2,000 years ago. Not fear. And unfortunately, there is not even a word in our language for Rachma. There is not a word in the Latin language from which these scriptures come. There is not a word in the Greek language from which what most people are preaching from come. For what Yeshua said was most important. And it sure as heck wasn't fear. It was an instruction to keep a filter in the frontal lobes of your brain open and operative all the time, and that that gateway, if it was open, 
became the, the, the entry point for active present love into your form. However much pain or poverty and generational pattern there was within your form, that the active presence of love comes through this gateway called Rachma. So the beginning of wisdom is Rachma for the creator, according to Yeshua. And I'll say that over the years, probably the majority of pre preachers that I've known, the majority, as I really think about it, never really thought of it before, the majority said fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Now, I know that, and, and many of them, when I've confronted them, and I've confronted many, oh, 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 I didn't really mean fear. I meant, you know, it's like have awe for God. Well, if you meant have awe for God, then say have awe for God. Don't tell me to fear God, because what I hear is what you really mean is fear. That's what you haven't resolved in your life and in your mind. Don't tell me there's another word, but you're going to use the word fear, because you're defrauding us and you're defrauding yourself. It's just a lie. The person who has, says has fear for God has unresolved fear and knows no better, even though they'll babble words about, oh, it really means to have all. Well, if it really means that, then say what it really means, have all for God. Yeah, that's closer to Rachma. It still isn't Rachma. It still isn't referring to the fact that in the frontal lobes of our brain, there is this filter in this gateway that brings active love, human life, into this human form. When Yeshua said, you know, he talked about how, how has such abundance dropped into such poverty? The state of being is designed to be embodied here in this world and bring with it its state of being, bring with it its abundance, its creativity, its purpose. And yet most people are cut off from that. They land here cut off from the source of their true wealth, and they come into family systems that are filled. Even family systems that people look at and say, that's a really loving family. Well, gee, if that's a really loving family, why are two out of five of the kids drunks? If that's a really loving family, why have there been seven divorces? If that's a really loving family, why aren't those two parents together still? Oh, they're together. Oh, do you know how many people I've worked with over the years that were together for decades and decades and decades after they divorced? You know, and I'm talking now not about a legal divorce. They still said they were married, but in fact, they were divorced decades ago. But they're still hanging around the church talking about what they haven't done in their own lives. So key, most important, recognize from this statement 36, anxiety is of the mind. There is nothing in your life that it's worth having anxiety over, and there's nothing in your life that can cause you to have anxiety. Except the thought disorders based in fear. Resolve them, and you'll be free of them. And thank you for joining us. Tomorrow we'll jump into saying number 37. <laughs>